As the federal government continues to explore new measures of raising revenue through tax reforms, there are concerns that no amount of tax revenue will be enough to finance the magnitude of fiscal indiscipline by the executives if the cost of governance is not addressed, even as debt mounts. Now, current total budget deficit has increased from 965.42 billion naira to 7.35 trillion naira, representing 3.99% of the GDP. Amid concerns about revenue generation as government intends to borrow more funds, more to fund the 2022 budget. Whilst debt-to-GDP ratio remains within the acceptable threshold, there are increasingly concerns about the nation's debt service to revenue ratio, which shows the country may be heading towards a debt crisis should the borrowing continue in the face of limited finances to support existing debt obligations. A partner at Pricewaterhouse Coopers, Esiri Agbeyi, joins me via Zoom. Thank you so much uh, for your time. I really appreciate this. Thank you, Tolu. I hope you can hear me. Loud and clear. Uh, over two decades, fiscal deficit has remained a predominant occurrence. Now, just fiscal deficit for 2021 amounted to about 6.45 trillion, and the fiscal deficit for this year is about 7.35 uh, trillion naira. And government forecast about 8 trillion naira uh, benchmark. Now, considering the uh, amount of money the NNPC is demanding, look at what we have for fuel subsidy. Uh, you know, how problematic would you say this is uh, as we move on in 2022? So I think um, the short answer to that question is it's it's really problematic um, and for very obvious reasons. Whilst we are a petroleum producing nation, we have to import basically everything that we um, consume. Um, and, and that includes um, refined petroleum products. Um, that obviously exposes us to a lot of global shocks such that if there is any um, spike, you know, from any of the global events, then it ultimately impacts us as a nation and ultimately what we consume. And just looking at the unfortunate incident between Russia and Ukraine is a good example to just see why, you know, we're very likely impacted. Um, there were increases in the petroleum price, but what he then turned to was um, automatically the refined products then become a bit more expensive um, because of the spike in that area. Um, and what that has done to us as a nation, in the absence of having a thriving midstream sector in the oil and gas industry, a thriving refinery um, market segment, is we're exposed to all of these shocks inevitably. Um, and so for the subsidies, which rely on the fact that um, the market, the PMS, the sale of PMS is not um, deregulated. It means government has to spend a lot more to um, pay marketers of these products. And so what it means is we have a fixed price at the pump, 145 or what the price may be depending on the day. But then the market realities would demand that the prices should be higher and therefore subsidies automatically increase. And this is not the first time we're having this kind of scenario. We had an 890% increase some five years ago, even though the petrol price at the time had only increased by 12%. And we're seeing the same now. So it therefore means that if we continue at this phase with the fact that we hold on to the subsidies to not deregulate the market and do not even improve on the business, relevant business segments in, um, in our country, will always be exposed to this. Deficits will always be on the rise. And our debt to GDP ratio as well will be unbearable. So in summary, it's definitely problematic. Brilliant. Uh, let's discuss some possible and sustainable resolutions taking uh, the timeline of 18 months of extension uh, to support the yes. subsidy regime. Government is now looking towards new borrowings, of course. However, IMF is cautioning uh, that tightening loan accessibility and volatility in the global economy raises the question of government looking to a more sustainable budgetary ratio in terms of revenue to debt ratio and out-of-the-box revenue gener uh, generation tactics. Um, what's your reaction to all of this? Well, I, I think the obvious reaction is governments, or we as a nation, I don't like to use the term government because I feel also responsible for it, 
just as you would. Um, but I guess the main thing we have to start thinking about is, you know, in the light of the deficits that we're seeing and the market realities, um, we definitely need to look at a way of bridging the deficit gap. And the only reason we have a deficit is because we don't have enough revenue to accommodate the expenses that we've incurred. And like any market or business person would do, it's really to look at those variables and start to think of what we can do differently. So it's not different from what we would have at the country level as well. Um, it's just at the country level, you therefore have to deal with a lot more a lot more people need to be catered to, and that includes those who are unemployed, to those who are employed. Those statistics, therefore, are very important in coming to a conclusion on what to do. So once we've identified the variables, which include revenue, and in this case, expenditure, we then want to look inwards to say, what are those line items we can deal with? And revenue, therefore, becomes a point of discussion. You know, how can we, increase the revenue for at all to cover the expenses that we believe are legitimate. And um, the legitimacy of those expenses definitely goes through different rounds, including having to go through the National Assembly to confirm that, yes, indeed, we have to incur these expenses. And over time, the cry has always been around, we need to improve on capital expenditure over and above recurrent expenditure. Because that's what the mainstay of the economy would then be. That's what's going to attract the right investors into the market. When you then look at revenues, we've already talked about the fact that, you know, being a mono economy on petrol or crude isn't sustainable and it has to be diversified. But more importantly as well, tax then becomes another base area that we want to look at and start to ask questions around how we can generate more revenues from the businesses that are thriving. Um, because ultimately, you don't then want to kill businesses because they put their head out to say they want to do something and then unnecessarily tax them. And we've had it for a very long time, outcries against the social contract, um, um, construct between the government and people and how these taxes are collected, but also how they are used. And one of the main things that definitely needs to be looked at is how we collect these taxes um, because whilst on the one hand government is saying we have a low tax to GDP ratio of 6%, you find a lot of taxpayers are also saying, well, wait, we're paying a lot of money already. We're having to incur so many expenses by ourselves without the government support to just make a living. And so um, when you look at that and also even look at some of the out-of-pocket expenses and taxes that businesses have to pay sometimes to... Um, the people we call Agbe Roads, um, but that's the informal tax collection, definitely. Um, the question is, where do all these taxes go to um, at the different levels, local government, state government, and federal government? And are we doing the right job in collecting and bringing it back to the coffers of government? Or are people just suffering unnecessarily and we're creating big gaps you know for enriching individuals and that's a very critical area to start to look at if we're going to mop up a lot of those revenues in terms of expenses we definitely want to start seeing you know the monies that we borrow you know go to capital expenditure uh, and that's a very legitimate reason um, because there's no country that can attract investors without the right business environment and it's one of the indices that will be used to measure how long you know investments stay on the land pool. now we've seen that most of our debt goes into recurrent expenditure and the reason is why um we've done several reports and i think a very notable one was the orosanya report that looked into you know just the viability of ministries, departments, agencies, um, and government sectors that we have to say, are all these expenses legit? You know, whilst we are looking towards employing people viably, we need to be able to ask ourselves, are we employing them productively to generate the kind of revenue that can sustain the nation? And where we want to see that revenue come from is really from the private sector, because honestly, the government has no business making the kind of money that we will or we will like to see in the country. What the business, the business of the government should be 
is providing that sustainable environment. And so when you look at the cost profile, staff costs of some of these agencies, it was very notable what the findings of that report were. And some of the recommendations included even merging some departments, some agencies and ministries with a view to reducing costs that were not productive. Um, and I think if we're able to focus on that, then it will go a long way to telling a different story for our country. And I'm hoping that, you know, the political willpower to do so resides in the next group of people that will take the nation by storm. <laughs> Indeed. So, uh, Very funny. But <laughs> <laughs> well, let me follow up with that. that do you, what do you make of that school of thought that believes that um, governments borrowing to finance fiscal deficits may crowd out private investment and, of course, aggravate interest rates and um, reduce access to investment funds uh, in the ecosystem? Yeah, I guess there's some um, sense in that, but you know, you can also juxtapose it with another school of thought that speaks to the fact that you know, um, private investments have still thrived regardless of the fact that we have a fiscal deficit. So the school of thought is not grounded or sufficient if we just um, label it as saying, you know, if we have. Um, to finance our fiscal deficits with borrowing, then we will crowd out private investments. I mean, just look at last year. We did have a fiscal deficit of about six trillion and over Naira, but we still had investments worth over two billion dollars um, coming into the tech space, right? And that was notable, you know, very notable to say the least. I missed. Um, the pandemic and just coming out of a recession and we still had those and what attracted those investments was not so much of um, the fiscal deficit of the nation but it was really about whether those investments would be bankable you know and the ideas proposed by those business owners you know whether or not they would generate income for the investors which is what the investors really are after how much money can i make what's the risk involved and in assessing that risk obviously the environment is considered um so yes whilst the fiscal deficit is one of the things that could um trigger or point towards the kind of risk that you would be taking it's compensated for by the reward that is then gotten from those investments which is why we saw a lot of investments flooding into the tech space because the rewards there is very very significant and just touching base again on the fiscal deficit nigeria is not alone in having fiscal deficits the greatest countries of the world including the u.s run on deficits and they borrow as well but I guess the difference is in looking at what we are borrowing for, for. And like I said before, it's very important that the borrowings are really put out for capital expenditure as opposed to recurrent expenditure. Because if we're not able to do so, then we run the risk of increasing um, inflation rates, increasing unemployment. Um, because what you then have is you have a stagnant pool of people within um, ministries and departments that are, aren't doing anything productive. Whereas, imagine if we had light, if we had roads, if we had access to finance, you know, well catered to, and all those borrowings were used from that. With that, what we then do is we have ripple effects in the economy in terms of you know, revenues that these companies can generate, self-employed people as well can generate and minimize their costs. Because at that point in time, you then have a shared pool, you know, of course, that reduces overall the cost to the businesses. But right now what's happening is a lot of businesses are incurring the cost. It's hitting their profit margin and they're incurring it independently without succor from the government. Ultimately, you wouldn't find a lot of returns from there but what's also more, um, what's even sadder is that we have, you know, so many hands that are sitting within government ministries and probably not doing anything that could do a lot more within the private sector. So it's really flipping that coin, I think, um, that will go a long way to, to us, for us as a nation. Hmm. 
pretty interesting discussion there. I almost finally, so very interesting. The time is far spent already. But I'd like to ask, because you talked about your Rosai report, do you think we have any chance at slimming the cost of governance? And on the other side, uh, what's your take with regards to attracting investments at this time? It's very important. Two in one, as we wrap yeah. up. <laughs> okay, so I think with the Arasai report, some of the um, recommendations included included merging some um, departments and agencies. I think about 52 or so of them um, were mentioned at the time. And we stopped short of implementing that report um, on the year, on the eve of the um, new government. So I think that was about 2014 when a white report was then issued, you know, and it was supposed to be implemented. But then we were going to have, you know, a change in government in 2015. So just not to be unpopular, you know, no one went ahead to implement anything that was in that report because then you lost the chance of winning the election. And it's interesting that we're now at a point where we need to ask that same question again. And we probably might see that we're taking a back seat, as we've done with the subsidy as well, to say, oh, we can't do the subsidy now, or we can't end the subsidy now, even though the PIA was you know, very clear on saying it had to be ended. We've extended that again, and we've not deregulated the PMS market. That's frustrating businesses, and that definitely is not going to attract the kind of investment we want because what will then happen is that people lose um, confidence in the, the market indices. You know, So we want to attract investment in the um, petroleum sector, having waited for over 20 years for the PIA to be implemented. And now we've gotten to this stage, and there's still stifling of business ideas through things like subsidy being on board still and ensuring that, you know, even the um, calculation of the PMS price is still stifled as much as possible because we want to just be pleasing to the people. And if we had allowed that market forces would dictate this, we would be in a situation similar to the telecom sector where, remember when we had to buy SIM cards at very expensive and ridiculous yeah. rates? Now SIM cards are for free. That's what we need to do in this sector. And that's what we need to do as a country as well, so that we don't then undermine the confidence that business investors might have. And um, I think one example is just when we had the rating of Nigeria go down in the early part of the year and euro bond investors or euro bonds were not taken up just because of that downgrading. You know, it's important that we're sending the right indices to the market. Otherwise, we run you know the disadvantage of not having the right investment in the market i mean the tech space is good enough for us to thrive in but we still have basic needs that have to be met and those areas need a lot of investment and those areas also need good um, um environments for doing business to to retain the the right investments a Syria Gwei partner, PWC. I must thank you so much for spending your time with us this afternoon. I appreciate this. Do enjoy the rest of your day and hope to see you soon. You totally have a good one. Bye.